Don't you hate when you have a great joke, but nobody is around to hear it? Mm-hmm. Yep. Are you going to tell that joke now? I can. You already heard it, though. Did you, I? You were the only one around to hear it. Oh. Uh, Spencer and I were getting it on at the gym. Yeah. Getting like. sweaty in the gym. Yeah, we were getting hot and sweaty in the gym today. And there's a certain guy who goes to the gym, and our gym is not very nice. So, like, the bathroom is just an old basement. So, the bathroom is just kind of where if you walk by, you could see if the door is open. And we have a feller who always pees with the door open. So, anyone who walks by will see them. And you know what? We were working out directly in eyesight of this. Like, it was mm-hmm. right across from us. And he goes in there knowing that we were there. And so, it starts pissing with the door open. So I says to you, Spencer, should I ask him if I can work in? Yeah. Hey! <laughs> That's a pretty good one. And then I thought of one later when I got home. I was thinking about that. I was like, oh, I got to tell Mitch, which I don't think I did tell her. I think I forgot. But I, I was going <laughs> to, I was like, you know what? It might have even been better if I was like, should I go ask him if he needs a spot? Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I hate that when you have like a really good joke and then no, you look around and there's nobody to hear it. Typical. Typical. You know what's so weird about that situation is it's always in the dark, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he never turns the light. Well, that's probably for the best. Yeah, that's mess-wise. That's better than like a month or two ago when <laughs> there was an old guy there, one of the older guys in the gym, and I went to wash my hands before lunch, before I left, and I walked over, and the door was open with the light on, and the dude just facing out, was just dropping a deuce. Mm-hmm. I'm like, why is the door open? It's two inches in front of you. <laughs> Shut it. Like, what are you doing? You just see this old man just... Uh, he was like, oh, I should have shut the door, but I can't now. <laughs> it's like, why can't you? <laughs> it's just like, what the fuck? And he's just looking at me like a sad dog. Like, you know when a, you see a dog shitting in the yeah. yard or something and it makes eye contact yeah. with you and it doesn't stop. No, but it just... Yeah. But it just, almost looks ashamed, yeah. but then it kind of looks like, no, nah, you shouldn't be watching me. Yeah. It was one of those deals. And I was just like, oh, I, mean, I didn't wash my hands. No, that would have been a little awkward. Just go, excuse me, buddy. <laughs> just right next to him. Hey, you need a spot? But you know what? As a man, we're kind of expected that gross situation to occur because, like, I was at the Renaissance Festival yesterday and their privy situation. I waited because they have a couple porta johns, but they just have the big ice piss trough. Uh. And it's right next to this little sink they have. I don't understand. Women will never understand this. I don't understand why we have to deal with this. Imagine, women, if you go to the restroom at any sporting event and. There's no partitions of any kind. You're just sitting right next to all the other women. But now imagine for some reason your vagina hangs out so they can see it. Mm-hmm. That's what it's, it's like just, to be It's man. just out in the open. Yeah. Like you, women don't understand. When you're peeing at the big trough, and I've been to many arenas that have the pee trough, and I'm like, yeah. oh, I'm not even, I'll just piss my pants. Fuck yeah. this. I'll piss in the sink. I'll find a corner somewhere. You get a bunch of drunk sports fans pissing next to each other, and that's already awkward enough. But then you know you're going to get the lookers, mm-hmm. and then you're going to get the guys who want a sword fight. Yeah. That's me. I, I got you, whap. But you imagine, like, some guy with a big old donger, and maybe he has cerebral palsy, and he's trying to, like, w- you know, shake it off or whatever, and he just fucking slaps your leg. Or you're even worse, your wiener. Yeah. Like, that would be terrible. But I'm sure that's happened. Statistically, that has had to have happened somewhere. Somewhere. But why do we have the pee troughs? It's, it's so barbaric. And it's gross. Well, I think what it is is because, like, that's the quickest, easiest way to get the amount of people pissing. Because you got thousands of people in there. If they're all waiting for an individual stall yeah. or urinal with a, like, divider to wear, like, you know, oh, we could only fit, like, five urinals with a divider here, but we can fit eight people standing shoulder to shoulder pissing. Uh, and there's always, like, a big dude that goes in and is touching your shoulder. What if, hear me out, big drain in the middle. And you just go in a circle and pee. Just, just like the Bukaki style, just yeah. Bukaki piss. <laughs> I'm surprised they haven't set that up. That'd be even worse. Oh, the, what about the sprayers, man? The sprayers. <laughs> and then it's one of those deals, too, if you're pee shy at all and you're standing there, and then it's always like, oh, these 50 guys know I'm not pissing. Yeah. What do I do? They know I'm not pissing, which makes it worse. And because you can't, you have to at least dribble something out before you yeah. put it back, or you're just like shaking the yeah. air, and it's just embarrassing. And then, like, if you really had to piss, too, then you're still full of piss. Mm. I just go into like a corner and just pee in the corner, especially in Pittsburgh. It's everybody pees. You're right, yeah. In the corner, it's dirty, stinky city. Uh, but I, I just, I don't understand that. It's like, why do we have to pee in the trough? Why can't we have a better? Si- There's no better system. No other idea. Well, it's better. Like you ever see like those, um, 
I think there's some place like overseas somewhere, like in like probably like Europe or one of those kind of places where it's like the they have for like the shitters, they have the the dividers, but they only go up to like short old white. Yeah. Like, so you could just turn and be like, Hey Jim, how you doing? You I'm I'm done with this uh book now. Do you wanna do you wanna borrow it? <laughs> they got him excited. <laughs> I have the solution for okay. the P trough. <laughs> Nitro has the solution. Glory hole style wall hole where you just walk up to it and put, put your it and just let go. Big enough it's not gonna touch your wiener, hopefully. <laughs> Why are you yelling? So loud, dude. It's okay. But just pee in the big hole. So everyone's still no, peeing as, next to each other, but you're in the hole. As long as there's nobody else on that other side of the <laughs> hole. Yeah. Or even just have, like, the wall stick out slightly for each little, not a partition, but just enough where you're not touching shoulders with anyone. Yeah. Or just have enough fucking toilets. I don't know. Like, I remember being at a place that was slightly different. It was like a 50 urinals, but those long ones that go all the way to the floor, mm. and then it's stretched across, and it's like, this somehow is worse than the trough, because well, well, now it's splashing your shins. Well, doesn't Japan have like those weird toilets that you hover over? They have this, the yeah, you have to squat over. I don't know how I feel about that, because you, you have to take one of your legs out of its pants. I never thought about that, but yeah, you got to do something, unless you got the balance. Well, Asians have like the, it's called like the Asian squat or something, where they just can sit on their heels, and it's fine. But Westerners, for some reason, like this is like some weird biology. Most Westerners can't sit like that comfortably. Like they're not straight up and down. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, all Asians are just like Olympic squat weightlifters. Like they can just straight line squat down and they just poop in the in a hole. But it's like they have all Jap Japan also has the fanciest toilets in the world. So why? Mm -hmm. but yeah. Why? Do I, yeah. Is it just to make the elderly feel better? Because that's got to be messy. Like imagine hovering over that and then just like. There's so many things that could go wrong. Well, one, if it's explosive and it goes all over your legs. Yeah, and so like if you got like a, the runs or like one of those little just like <gasps> like the wet ones, like. Yeah. And then what about two? Like you know, you log in it and like I don't know, you're off balance or whatever. And as as soon as the break happens, it just poop and then just lands in your underwear or <laughs> like, hits the back of your knee and takes <laughs> you out. Or what if it's just a really long log that just weighs you down and starts <laughs> yeah. pulling you? I don't know. I don't like any of it. If I can help it, I just don't use public restrooms that much. But sometimes you got to. Mm -hmm. Still better than Walmart restrooms. Those are fucking gross. Anything's better than a Walmart restroom. Maybe not certain gas stations I've been to. It's close. Mm. Uh, anyway, folks, we are talking... What the fuck are we talking? Revenge. Revenge, maybe. I think we're talking about revenge today, so we probably should have made the uh, cold open not funny joke stuff. Should have been about revenge. Revenge can be funny. It could be hilarious if gone awry or gone right. We'll get into that later. Yeah, anyway, stick around. We'll teach you how to write revenge novels and all that stuff. You are here and you are special because you are listening to the Drunken Pen Writing Podcast, mother... Mm -mm 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 -mm. I am your host, Caleb James. With me today, Spencer, the Providence Pickle Puncher Church. Don't like them pickles. I know you don't like pickles. You actually don't like pickles. Uh, yeah. You are, you don't indulge in a, a crisp dill. I'm, I'm anti-pickle. No uh, sweet gherkins. Nope. No, uh, fat, I don't know, what a fat, some other pickle. Yeah. I don't know that many pickle names, you know? <laughs> are there a lot of pickle varieties? I don't know. Uh, today we are discussing, Spencer, because you said this was a great topic. I didn't certainly pick this. How to write a <laughs> revenge story that stuns readers. I guess I'll hold my phone like an old man who can't see. Like, <laughs> because it's too close to the mic, all of a sudden it starts making noise. Do you know what makes a good revenge plot? Revenge. But why, Spencer? What? Obviously, the revenge is a big part of the revenge. No, what? I'm gonna, this thing's going to blow me away. Obviously, <laughs> the revenge is an important part of the revenge plot. But, Spencer, we the have... The cause? The cause. That's a good one. Um, that would I, I think that would be a strong motive. Mm -hmm. A strong motive leads to a good revenge yeah. story. Because you have a weak motive. Well, yeah. Pretty stupid revenge story. I don't like this. I don't like anything that's happening here. <laughs> Listen, folks, you don't know this, 
But Spencer had to switch his days for podcast recording. Mm -hmm. For fucking 17 years now, (laughs) or however long we've been doing this, we've been recording every Thursday night at 6 p.m. It is Monday night at 6 p.m. It's it's all weird and And then next week, I think it's Tuesday. Yeah. Monday or Tuesday, we don't know yet. Well, I usually edit the podcast on Monday, so I would prefer Tuesdays, but we'll see what happens. I don't know. But, like, my dog is having a fit over here. He's like, Spencer's not supposed to be here on Monday, so he's jumping around. He's fucking biting stuff. Yogurt, he was down here just being a cat. Making hair everywhere. He, he did just make hair. He literally just, like, flexed, and it grew real big and <laughs> fell off. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know. This is weird. I was writing, and then he came over, and I was like, oh, Spencer's here now. I guess we got to record, because that's what happens. My mic is, like, hissing and popping and blowing. My phone's doing stuff. Everybody's texting me, because... Normally, they know not to text me during podcasts, but I didn't tell anybody but, yeah. that we're recording a podcast today. And now it's going to be ruined for life. Ruined. Unretrievable. We'll never get the day back. Never. Even if things go back to normal somehow, which they probably will never, ever do that. No. But just say we got the Thursday spot at six again. I feel like it's, it's going to be ruined. It will never, nothing will ever be the same again. We apparently have a big interview with some literary person at the end of the month. And guess what? Spencer's not even going to be able to be here for Maybe, it probably yeah. because it's on a fucking Thursday because we scheduled it before his whole world crashed <laughs> and burned. And now here we are, aggravated. So let me get, let me ask you this. Is that all enough? For a revenge plot. Is that a good motive? It, it could Having be. your life uprooted and ruining your whole podcast situation. I, I rather, I, uh, I, I feel like I need to plead the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I don't think we really have to go into why you need a strong motive. That's a pretty simple. Yeah. Uh, the stronger the motive, the better. We can go we, with the classic, your spouse has been murdered. Yeah. Your dog has been murdered, John Wick. Your John Wick has been murdered and the dog gets revenge. That's a good boy. It's yeah. a graphic novel. You know, there's various forms. Usually murder. It doesn't have to be murder. Somebody can rob you. Somebody can steal your livelihood. Somebody can fuck up your podcast time. There's <laughs> lots of great motives <laughs> for, revenge. For, for revenge. And I will say this. Revenge does not have to be murder. No. Usually we think back to... Uh, and by the way, if you're anyone's wondering... Nobody's wondering. But if you were wondering, Spencer... Why I picked revenge to talk about today is because I started Hamlet this morning. Yes, yes. Which is one of the great revenge tales. It got me thinking about revenge story and some of my favorite ones. And I'm sure we'll go back to these, but I think of like a lot of the stories I've read over the years are revenge based to mm. some degree. Yeah. Carrie. Yeah. Like I said, we'll get back to that. I don't want to go into that right now because then, because that, we're going to bring those up with points most likely. Yeah. Or absolutely not. I haven't decided. A strong motive is very important for a good revenge story. The weaker the motive, uh, the less interested the reader is going to mm. be because they're not going to connect with the character. And if they don't connect with the character, why do they care about the character getting their revenge? Mm. Another good one, which I, it might be on the list. I don't know. This is I'm just loosely basing this list here off of. Uh, I don't even know what this website is. Self publishing school. Mm. I'm just doing. I'm not reading their stuff. I'm just doing the headlines. But a. Uh, Another good aspect to the revenge story with the strong motive is also getting the readers to want to see the villain get their comeuppance. So Mm -hmm. the more the villain has it coming, the more the reader will be invested in the story and want to see the villain get their comeuppance. And I think when it also comes to the motive, what you have to consider and try to figure out is the telling of the motive. Like, when in the story do you let that information drop? Yeah. Do you do it really, really early in the morning, or do you have it be more of a mystery that you slowly unravel? Because mm-hmm. like you say, like, the bad guy, sometimes, like, uh, some of the good ones are, like, whenever the story starts out with who you think the bad guy is until you find out what they're doing, and it's like, oh, no, they're actually the good guy, you know, getting their revenge on, you know, on the bad guy. Yeah. Depending on the story you tell and... If, if it's a straight revenge piece, the earlier the better. Like, take mm. a John Wick almost at the very beginning. Introduce Death the Wish. character. Yeah, Death Wish. Or you could think, like, if it's a side character who is invested in the protagonist. Maybe they're not the sole protagonist. They're invested in the protagonist's situation and want to get revenge mm. for whatever. I'm thinking, like, The Princess Bride. My name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Yeah. You know his story from the beginning, but also The Man in Black He is not actually out to get revenge. He just wants to get his bride back, but revenge kind of goes with it. But he actually does not get his revenge in that story because he doesn't. That's not what he's interested in. He just wants to get his lady back. But Inigo Montoya wants revenge. And his whole life is a rousing tale of revenge. 
And you could tell fun stories like that, but I like stories where you have different aspects of character arcs. So you have the revenge guy, the guy who's just along for the ride. Most ensemble pieces, they have their characters who have their own motives, and not everyone's can be revenge because that would be boring. Yeah. Another good aspect of a, a revenge story, to have a good, well-written revenge story, the revenge can't be easy to get. No. It's got to be difficult. To, you have yeah. to go through some goddamn hoops. You have to go through some dungeons and some... uh you know, haunted woods and just all the fun stuff. Uh, if you're writing fantasy, if you're writing an urban crime, you have to go through a whole mobster, a uh, whole mob of Russians, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. We were talking about absurdism last episode, and I think it would be funny if you did have a story that you really build up something that happened to the protagonist that was off, just really go into great detail, and then he gets his revenge immediately, and mm. it's like really anticlimactic, and it's just over. Or the um the opposite like was that you could be like this guy, you know, has this elaborate revenge scenario and stuff plot, but when you find out it's for like the most stupid, like minute thing, yeah, that has like there's no need for revenge, but it's just like the guy, the guy spilled chili <laughs> yeah. on him at a restaurant yeah. or something, and then he goes on this lifelong crusade because he was embarrassed in front of his mm. date. Uh, here's another aspect of a revenge story that makes it well written. The revenge is high stakes, Spencer. If you, uh, the higher the stakes, and I would say the higher the consequences of getting the revenge, the more interesting the story. The reader wants a, a well-liked protagonist to get the revenge and the villain to get their comeuppance. But a really good story makes it so the reader knows if the protagonist gets their revenge, then perhaps something bad will happen. Mm -hmm. Perhaps the revenge, you know, a dish best served cold, if they get the revenge, then they might actually ruin their life anyway. Mm -hmm. So say they're avenging their dead wife, but in doing so, they will die. It's the ultimate. Or end up going to like jail or something. Less ultimate, but yes, we're going with high risk. Mm -hmm. So the higher the risk, what's higher the dying? Becoming a vegetable. Mm -hmm. That could be pretty bad. But if you're a vegetable, you don't know Ooh, you're a vegetable. You don't right? care. Yeah. So th that could be interesting. You could definitely play with that as just having, uh, you know, your villain... Being the most heinous character, but at the end, if the, like, the old, I have the gun to your head, but if I pull the trigger, think of, uh, the movie Seven. Mm. The very end, he finds out his wife was killed by the guy, and he puts the gun to Kevin Spacey's head, spoiler. Meh. And if he pulls the trigger, his life is ruined, mm -hmm. but he gets his revenge. If he doesn't pull the trigger and he's the bigger man, then, the, I mean, the character's not gonna get away scot free, he's gonna go to jail, but, uh, he doesn't get his satisfaction, obviously. He, uh, I mean, he gets his, uh, I don't know, I guess his satisfaction was in him getting shot, so, because mm -hmm. it was a really heinous villain. But, ultimately, in that movie, Brad Pitt's character shoots him, and he gets his revenge, but at what cost? Probably his livelihood. But then again, his wife was just murdered, so what mm -hmm. livelihood did he have left? I don't know. In that movie, I don't think he really cared about his wife as much, because why was he out busting criminals so often, you know? Right. The old cop story. You also need compelling characters, a good hero, victim, and perpetrator. We already talked about that a bit. The better the backup characters and the side characters, which probably goes with any story, but for a revenge piece, I think it's good to have a good counterbalance. You have one character is really revenge-oriented. like oriented. That's what his motive is. That's what he, his ultimate goal is. You probably want like another character, at least, who's maybe the voice of reason. Hey, this isn't going to be good, man. Like, revenge is never good. Like, you just let it go. And uh, that could also, you know, then you can have some drama thrown in because maybe you have a brother and sister and the brother wants revenge and the sister just wants to let it go. But then they're fighting. Now they're fighting each other. And it's a battle of ideologies, perhaps. Here's a good structure for your revenge story. Start with the wrongdoing. So, again, John Wick style, you have the big catalyst for the whole story and the whole franchise set almost at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Plotting revenge setbacks. Uh, so, when you're plotting a revenge story, you definitely have to have setbacks. And that goes with any so story. You know, it can't just be easily gotten, like we said. So, you have to have your character be able to go through the story and something that keeps holding them back, holding them back. That way, when they finally do get their revenge, or if they decide not to get their revenge, it's just like... Yeah, you know, it's it's uh satisfactory word I'm looking for. You got to tease it a little. You got to tease it. You got to tease it a lot. You got to rub it a little bit. Don't feel don't be afraid. Don't shy away from having the revenge almost there, 
Maybe even at the very beginning, he sees the bad guy, and he can take the shot, but then... Some one of the thugs jump in front of, like, one of his bodyguards yeah. take the shot, and he gets away. The or... gun jams, or even worse, a little girl is there. He realizes the, the, you know, the evil villain has a daughter of his own, and perhaps the villain killed the protagonist's daughter, but then he sees that the villain has a daughter of his own. So now the revenge gets complicated. Do you shoot the villain getting revenge but also traumatizing the little innocent girl do you shoot the innocent girl because that's the ultimate revenge yeah. is you know eye for an eye kid for a kid or do you not shoot anybody mm. and then you're just not a you're not as evil as the villain because that's another aspect too is anytime you have the vi- uh, the protagonist get revenge you are making them a villain which is why mm. batman does not kill yeah. batman does not get revenge he did because Batman didn't go after the person who killed his parents and murder him in most story arcs. Yeah, Spider Man was a different situation. His uncle Ben was killed, and what turns him into Spider Man really? Because he went to get the revenge and realized it was the wrong road to take. At least in most tellings that I'm aware of. Because they throw in so many fucking origins anymore. Yeah, it's hard to say. Well, no, it was the fault because he let the guy go, and that's the guy. Mm. So like, but then he still has to go and track that guy down again. But yeah, wasn't there an iteration in one of the movies where he kills the guy? Or in yeah, the yeah, yeah. In the uh, the Toby Wire, whenever he after Uncle Ben dies and he finds the guy in the warehouse or whatever, he like yeah. pushes him out a window. The big one, which we were just discussing, is the confrontation. So when you're structuring the revenge story, you really want that confrontation, especially the final conf. I would tease the confrontations. Maybe they run into each other. I think of old '80s action movies. You have the fight, but it's not the final fight. Yeah. You know, you have a lot of ass kicking. Usually, the protagonist loses the fight or. If he does get the upper hand, go old school wrestling style, you know, thumb to the eye, mm. uppercut to the groin, and then the bad guy gets away, something like that. Uh, and then the ending, obviously, you have to write a good ending. Well, I was going to say, a lot of times I find that what makes it really good is that the protagonist and antagonist don't even really meet to, like, the end, like, you know, because the protagonist is trying, is going through all the different levels and, and roadblocks that the, right. the antagonist is setting up. You know, like you said, you they might be in the same room for a moment or something like that, but they don't have really any contact or like the pro or the antagonist might not even know why the protagonist is, is after them. Yeah. You know, because they've done so much stuff. They might, you know, like, well, you know, I know I probably done something to deserve it, but I don't know who this, but, you know, mm-hmm. or we could even scale it back to a situation, say uh, a drunk driver hits a kid and he's so drunk that he drives away and didn't even realize yeah. he ever hit a kid. And then the protagonist maybe saw him driving away and is hunting him. And the protagonist or the, the villain doesn't even know that he did this. Yeah. And then maybe when he finds out, he's like, fuck, I'm, maybe he's not an actual bad guy, you yeah. know? Maybe he's just a, you know drunk driving, so he's probably a piece of shit to a degree, but not a murderer. Mm-hmm. But you could have a story like that unfold where at the end, it's like, do you get your revenge or do you understand that this was a person that just made a very bad mistake? Well, like, well, and just with that scenario, and then interesting tweak would be by the time that the person found the the drunk driver the drunk driver has already started to like make amends and is doing yeah. like is is you know doing like uh aa and you know and trying to better themselves and it's like where do you let them go on that course to see if they do in fact learn and become a better person from this or you just fucking end them just on the chance that they might do it again. That reminds me of a real life villain. I think his name was General Buck Naked. <laughs> I'm not joking. It was like an African yeah. warlord or something that would get naked and just slaughter people. And he was a huge piece of shit. But I'm pretty sure he like became like a religious person or something mm-hmm. and just like started doing a bunch of good. And that's one of the situations like you probably should still die. But yeah, yeah it's like who, who am I to say like I'm not the you know the judge i'm not judge dread but yeah i I like that idea too just having a character who is out for revenge but then you have the moral obligation of maybe letting this person live is the right move Mm -hmm. and then it's like if i kill him then i'm the bad guy Uh, i always like those kind of stories and i i promise i did not read this before i said the some of the titles i mentioned earlier Mm -hmm. but it has examples of revenge stories and literally the first three the Princess Bride by William Golden, yeah. Carrie by Stephen King, yeah. and Hamlet by William Shakespeare. Oh, wow. So I got all three of them. I brought up Carrie because that was one of the ones where you really feel for the protagonist, and you understand. Like most of us, we can understand what it's like to be bullied in school to a degree. Why it's such an effective horror story is because 
she's bullied, so you fully want her to get a mm. revenge. But then when she does, it's so horrific. You're like, well, a lot of those people didn't deserve it. Yeah. Like, yeah, sure, there were some shit heels that probably deserved to be revenged upon. But none of them actually did anything that deserved to be murdered. Right. You know? Yeah. Like, you know, even even ones that still might have, like, picked on her, you know, when they probably shouldn't have, didn't necessarily dump the blood on her. But even the ones that dumped the blood on her, does that mean you should be killed? Obviously, hers was very emotionally driven. So she, you know, think a school shooter, she might have got into the situation and there's just no going back. Well, that was always kind of like a, a hint of like like mental problem yeah. too from being brought up in such a religious home and having such a crazy mother you know with that yeah. story that that just makes it so that we're like whenever that person do, a person like that does crack there's really no you know what mm. i mean holding back well that story always reminded me of when i hear people say if i saw somebody robbing my house and they're running out of my house with my tv and out of a gun i'm gonna shoot them and mm-hmm. kill them and i always thought to myself I understand wanting to kill somebody that just invaded your home and robbed you, but at the same time, is a TV worth a life? Yeah. Like, even if you could shoot them and get away with it completely, you just killed somebody because of TV. Right. Is a fucking couple hundred dollar TV really worth a human life? And for me, no. Like, I'm not having that on my conscience. Right. I'm not going to shoot somebody in the back because they stole my TV, but so many people think that's fine. What if they was close enough and you know you could get him in the leg and stop him? Yeah, I'd shoot him in the leg or just bust him up. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's another thing if they have a gun or something. But if they're running from you. Yeah, if they're leaving. And then they just got your TV or something. Well, and that's also when the law gets tricky. Yeah, it gets, it's 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 pretty tricky. That's one of those things. Usually uh, anymore, the homeowner is not favored in the court of law when they shoot somebody in the back. And like I said, the Princess Bride, that's a fun revenge story. Classic fantasy. Uh, Hamlet, you know, that's a, the tragic revenge. And I... I'm pretty sure that actually ends with everybody dead. So it's one of those ones. Revenge does not. Well, I haven't like really read any any Shakespeare myself, but like you know, I've seen and read other things, either like adaptation or like based on stuff. Did, isn't like revenge kind of like one of the things that he likes to kind of like mess around with? Because isn't like um oh what's the the one that, Macbeth? Yeah, Macbeth. That has you know that has a lot of like revenge. It may not be solely about revenge, but it has like a lot of you know those themes and motives in it. It definitely ends with revenge when Macbeth gets his, but it's more for the most of it because like the wrestling one you read, yeah. it's about once gaining and, power. Yeah, and, once it needs. Yeah, but then obviously at the end, the people that were done wrong want revenge. So yeah, it ultimately does end in revenge. Hamlet, the whole story arc is revenge Revenge, hamlet's father is killed by his uncle who marries his mother and he wants to get revenge and it actually gets to the point where hamlet becomes the bad guy from my understanding well and say well that's kind of like in the snow you brought up you know with like bad guy kills guy's daughter he goes to kill bad guy notice that she has a daughter does he just kill him and then that daughter grows up wanting to kill that guy that's the kill bill scenario where beatrix kiddo kills i forget what uh Vivica A. Fox's mm-hmm. character, she gets revenge on her and kills her in front of her daughter. And then she even says, you know, to the daughter, when you grow up, if you want to come after me, come on, yeah. I get it. So <laughs> that's one of those things where it's like, I accept it. She knew the daughter was there and she still went through with the killing. Next up is True Grit by Charles Portis. I have not seen the movie or read the no. the book. But uh, it's a Western, so I think that, again, like, A lot of, like, I think that's a heavy theme in in a lot of Westerns. I'm actually going to read the synopsis because I always heard this name, uh, but I didn't realize it was from this book. It's one of the greatest names ever. Okay. True Grit follows a 14-year-old girl who wants revenge for her father's murder. She seeks out a deputy marshal and finds one in the drunk, one-eyed rooster Cogburn. (laughs) And the two head head out in search of the killer. I always always never knew that was from True Grit, Rooster Cogburn. I always heard that name. That's a great fucking name. Dick Codburn. This is one of my favorite revenge stories because it's more horror esque. Really, I never even understood exactly what the revenge was. I don't. I don't remember the Cask of Amontillado by Edgar Allan Poe, mm. where he bricks the guy up in the wall. Oh, okay, yeah. Well, that's a great revenge story. That's it. Well, I think we could talk a little bit more about like how the different kind of revenge. Like, I, like we were saying, like, uh, like I think revenge also leaves you up to like. Uh, to tell a kind of like uh dark comedies if you do it correctly, because like um like how we were saying sometimes like uh revenge will have you not thinking straight and properly, yeah, which will lead you to make 
you know, more rash decisions without thinking that could cause more problems for you down, you know, down the line. Right. And like, you know, especially when it involves like a lot of killing and, and, and who you're going through and stuff like that. I think that like you can, if you're good about it, you can do like, you know, some really dark comedy, you know, stuff with that, a little bit more humorous or like um, how we was talking about the Estodiaism. You know, just a little, a little bit more crazy, amp, amp it up a little bit. Because things like, uh, like Crank, you know, Crank, that, yeah. you know what I mean? Just something like that, kind of. I am I was trying to think while you're talking about some absurdist uh, revenge mm-hmm. stories. And I'm like, I've seen some really funny movies where they play with that. But I don't know of just like a straight book that I can mm-hmm. think of reading, having read. That was like revenge based, but it was really goofy. <clears throat> but you could definitely do an outlandish revenge story that's just hilarious and, uh. Maybe the pay. I feel like the pay payoff is usually not going to be as good because you're not invested on a deeply emotional yeah. level. More of just a. I hope he gets like. Yeah. You probably don't even care if he gets a pie in the face. I don't know. What's your favorite revenge tale that you've read or watched? Hmm. I'll give you my movies first. Okay. Kill Bill one and two. I think the uh, that's definitely got to be higher up on it just because of the fun factor. Yeah. That's like an outlandish old school kung fu revenge story. I've not seen True Grit. I don't know if Pulp Fiction really counts as a revenge story because Bruce Willis does go back for some revenge, kind of right? Or I mean, I guess you could maybe say his part of the story could deal with revenge, but not Marcellus like... Wallace gets revenge in a horrific way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to, okay, so what book wise though? What would be some good uh, books? Like I said, the Casco Money. I, I kind of named the ones I already really enjoyed. Does Stephen King have a lot of revenge stuff? I mean, like, again, like, they might have a part in it. Like, you know what I mean? But it's not, like, the yeah, basis of the novel. Yeah. Not that I can really think of that comes to t- comes to mind. Because now that, you know, that you asked the question, I'm having trouble drinking of, thinking of anything that we haven't really mentioned already. Yeah. Uh, that's one of those things. Like, I know as soon as we get off air, I'm going to think of a million of them. But. Well, also, too, because I also think, like, sometimes you can also, like, tag like the revenge things into like a a mystery thriller too kind of sometimes yeah and that can kind of muddy the waters a little bit well here i'll, I'll help us out here. okay yeah you're just gonna type in best revenge stories really lord of the rings okay. i mean i guess it kind of counts because uh you know the bad guy wants to get his revenge that's a you know what that's another one we actually didn't discuss the bad guy is the one trying to get revenge. Yeah. That's a different kind of story. That's a lot of, like, superhero stuff, you know, it's the bad guy. The bad guy, guy is I... trying to get revenge. Yeah, Something and... was done to him, and then it's like, he, that's good motive. Mm-hmm. Good motive on the, the bad guy. When you have a, a a villain with a good motive for revenge, then the hero of the story isn't actually revenging. He's just trying to yeah, stop, stop the villain. Yeah. yeah, that's always a good one. Because then that has an opposite moral dilemma where it's like, is it bad for the good guy to stop the bad guy if the bad guy's revenge is just? Right. Because if it was the shoe was on the other foot and the good guy was the one that wanted revenge, would he be the bad guy? Uh, Your House Will Pay by Steph Chaw. Never heard of it. No. Confessions. Okay, this is going to be all new books we never heard of. Never heard of it. Never heard of it. I want, I want some all time, you know. I'm trying to think of some all time. Some older stuff that we might have heard of. Yeah. Twelve revenge books, best served cold. Nah. What about like some horror stuff? Blood Meridian. Uh, no. We'll, we'll we'll think of that in a second. But number one on this list, the count. This is a hundred. Whoa! Wow. I'm not gonna do all hundred. No. Count of Monte Cristo. Yes. Of course. I just haven't read that yet. But yes, I can. That's a fun revenge tale, isn't it? Two. Hamlet. Number three. Wuthering Heights. Hmm. Never read it, so I can't judge. Uh, Gone Girl. That's a famous one. Yeah. Um. Did I see the movie? I think I did. I saw the other revenge but, movie, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. That's yeah. what I'm thinking. I about. never, I never seen that one. I think I seen Gone Girl, but I think it was been forever, like when it first came out. The dra- DVD, on like on VH, I never read the thing. The Dragon Tattoo was good because at least in the book version, I know, I think she did in the movie too. Uh, some guy like rapes her and she gets him and she sticks a dildo up his butt and then she kicks it. Oh, yeah. I think it's a dildo or something worse. Corrupt Devil's Night Number One by Penelope Douglas is five. Never heard of it. Mm-hmm. The Girl Who Kicked the Hornet's Nest. Um, that is the third book in the Dragon Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Uh, seven's Burn for Burn, number one. 
Uh, eight, Princess Bride. Nine, The Risk Mindfuck, number one. Uh, number 10 is Debt, the first 5,000 years. Then we have Game of Thrones. Of course, Game of Thrones would make the list. Yeah, that makes sense. The Girl Who Played with Fire. That's the also the uh, dragon. I don't like when they do sequels and stuff on here. The Great Gatsby. I mean, it ends in revenge, but I don't think the book, the whole book is not revenge. Uh, again, the Magic Wallflowers, Crooked Kingdoms of something like Rose. A Rogue by, okay, we get the gist of it. Most of these are just, uh, other books in the sequel. Uh, horror books. So you had horror books in mind? Well, I was thinking more like, like movies because couldn't, like, at, like, the first Jason, isn't that kind of revenge? The like? mom is getting revenge on her drowned son due yeah. to the negligence of the camp counselors who were just, you know, giving each other hickeys. Yeah. So she murders them. That's a good I'm, one. Uh, the Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah, I was gonna say. Yeah, he's just he. Now, granted, he probably deserved to get murdered by parents. Maybe he definitely. But like you know, <laughs> but yeah, like it's like him getting back. You know, we like, oh, you killed me. Well, I'm just gonna fucking murder every everybody's kid. His revenge was good because he wasn't killing the ones that did him wrong. He was right. killing their kids. Yeah, the ones he was gonna diddle. So fuck you. Like, right. uh, I think they retconned it so in the original, he's just a child murderer. Mm. He did all. Yeah. What are you murdering? Yeah. You got knives for fingers. What are you just murdering? <laughs> Fuck off, dude. I'm trying to think of bad revenge movies, like where the, it's just a re- weak revenge tale. Well, Mike Myers, he wasn't getting revenge. He was just a psycho. Psychopath. And then eventually he was a witch or something. And he was infested with demon seed. That sounds better than yeah. possessed, right? Yeah. All right. Well, we should do a possessed episode sometime. Yeah. Hey, for Halloween. Maybe, yeah. Like possession stories. Uh, I think we broke it down enough how to write. That was the main thing was how to write them. Um, I actually don't read a lot of revenge stuff. Yeah. Maybe it's just not the genres I read. I'm sure a lot of mystery crime has revenge as the catalyst. I'm sure a lot of horror books have a revenge story. I just, I'm a literary guy now, so. <laughs> Snap. And you're a Stephen King guy who doesn't write a lot about revenge or mm. not the main focus. Yeah. Yeah, we'll have to... Maybe do a second episode eventually and do a deep dive into revenge stories and which ones we've read, uh, which ones would be considered. But like I said, some of the most classic ones are also the most obvious, yeah. where even the word revenge is used in yeah. the story a bunch of times. Um, if you folks like this kind of episode, let us know on any of the following Twitter slash X, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. You can find us at DPW Podcast. You can follow me at calebjamesk.com. We are getting closer to things I can talk about publishing-wise, so that's exciting. Uh, And you can follow Spencer's OnlyFans at the Providence Pussy Popper? Pimple Popper? Pickle Puncher. Pickle Porker? Uh, Spencer at the the Providence Pickle Puncher. That's a... Why why pickles? Because I don't like pickles. Why are you punching them? Because I don't like them. Do you hold them and punch them, or do you punch them in a big... Like the big tub that you used to fish your whole dirty arm in <laughs> just, before just COVID. Into the jar. <laughs> I want my whole arm up to the fucking shoulder into this net. And people didn't use deodorant back then. And they're just all sweaty. And just <laughs> pull a dill out. And just start biting it. That's sick. Cost you a nickel. Cost you more in penicillin. <laughs> uh, anyway, we thank you for listening. And we will check you out next time.